Hello and welcome to Worship at Mount Calvary online. Uh, we're so glad you came to join us today. So we are uh, beginning uh, today a sermon series on the book of Esther. It's a three-part sermon series entitled, Hello God, Are You There? And the book of Esther tells the story of a young Jewish woman, a very beautiful woman named Esther, but it's actually telling a much wider story and a much narrower story at the same time. It's a story about the fate of God's chosen people, the Israelites, and it's hanging in the balance in this story. But it's also a story about life and death and about self-indulgent pride, about cowardice and bravery. So it's a big story. It's a big epic story. It's also a very narrow and focused story. It's a story about your life and about God in your life in times of confusion and uncertainty. So I hope you come along for the three Sundays we spend in the book of Esther. I think you'll have a wonderful journey and you'll grow closer to God in the process. And so let's begin with a prayer. Uh, God, we pray that our time together this day would lead us closer to you to understand your word and to glory in your love for each of us. In Jesus we pray, amen. Our first reading for today is from the book of Esther, Esther chapter 2, verse 15, through chapter 3, verse 2. When the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of her uncle Abihel, to go to the king, she asked for nothing, nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet Esther's banquet for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, but Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigtana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated, and found to be true, the officials were hanged on a gallows. All this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman. For the king had commanded this concerning him, but Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, beginning at verse 23. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, Lord, we have left everything to follow you. 
I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the Gospel of the Lord. you 
there are a lot of things you can pull from the book of Esther. And this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to pull one key question. We're going to try to answer one key question. And the question really has to do with uh, how you experience God in your life. It's very important. Uh, if you've ever wondered if God is present in your life, whether he cares about what's happening to you, then Esther is the book for you. Um, maybe you're feeling that way right now. Maybe uh, you have a sense of loss that you're grieving. Or maybe what you found is you're going through this cycle of defeat and despair for the umpteenth time. You can't seem to climb through the cycle. And you're asking, God, are you even there in my life? And then the book of Esther, and this is why Esther is so important for you if you're in that kind of a situation or you've ever been there. The book of Esther, it appears as though God is absent throughout the book. He's never mentioned. His name is never mentioned. No one ever prays to him. No one ever talks about him. But what we're going to learn is throughout the book, God is busy doing what God does. He's never absent. It seems to... Uh, it on the surface, as you go into the book of Esther, that God's not intervening. Everyone's sort of on their own, sloshing through life the best they can, doing what they can do. Nothing that happens in the book is referenced back to God as the author. But we're going to see in this book and in this sermon today that God is always intervening for the sake of his people. The book of Esther opens up with the king of Persia. We're going to show the king of Persia as the king of clubs. The king of Persia at the time of Esther is Xerxes. You may have heard of Xerxes if you ever watched that movie a few years back, The 300, where the people of Sparta resisted Xerxes' invasion of Greece. Xerxes is the most powerful and dangerous man of his day. He's always planning the next conquest, and he usually wins. He's obsessed with looking good and showing off his power to others. So in chapter 1 of, of Esther, Xerxes has gathered all the leaders of Persia for 180 days. And most archaeologists believe this happened between 483 and 482 BC. They believe that what he was doing was planning and promoting amongst his people the invasion of Greece. Throughout the 180 days, Xerxes displays the vast wealth and might of his kingdom uh, in essence, he's saying we have overwhelming resources to defeat our enemies. The last seven days of the 180 days, Xerxes throw this, throws a massive, decadent feast for this huge entourage of military leaders, political leaders, all men here. Uh, and everybody gets filled with food and they're all boozed up. And at the end of this feast, on the last day, on the seventh day, Xerxes decides he wants to show off his beautiful wife, Queen Vashti. Here we go. Here's Queen Vashti, the Queen of Spades. So imagine that. Prideful, besotted, powerful Xerxes commands his wife to come out on the stage and show her beauty to a crowd of leering, drunken men. Ooh, women in the audience today, how would you feel about that? Vashti has great courage. And she says to the king of everything here, Xerxes, she says, no, I'm not coming out. Ooh, she knows she should be treated like a piece of meat. She knows what she's walking into. So what happens is, of course, Xerxes, the king of everything, is humiliated in front of all of the leaders of Persia by his strong-willed queen and wife. The most powerful man on earth gets turned down by his wife. I can hear cheers coming up through the video right this minute. So Xerxes, being the most powerful man, banishes his wife Vashti uh, from his presence. She can no longer be queen. And the search begins for a new queen throughout the 127 provinces of Persia. In one of those provinces, there lives two Jewish cousins, Aster, Esther, the queen of hearts, isn't that clever? And her older, wise cousin, Mordecai, the jack of hearts. Uh, Esther is very beautiful. Uh, she has been uh, uh, 
in Mordecai's care since Esther's parents died when she was just a very little girl. Her cousin Mordecai took her home and treated her as part of his family, as one of his children. So she's so beautiful that she is made part of the harem of Xerxes. She is brought to uh, Xerxes' uh, uh, court where she is now being groomed to become possibly the queen, but she's in competition. So this is like the Miss America contest or something like that. She goes through a solid year of beauty treatments and training in the harem of Xerxes. And Mordecai is quite worried about his young cousin. Every day, the Bible says, he goes there to where the harem is sequestered and he checks in with Esther to make sure she's okay. And he's advised her, he says, don't tell anybody of your Jewish heritage. Keep your mouth shut and keep your head down. A year later, Esther has completed her training, her beauty treatments. She is taken into King Xerxes and wouldn't you know it, the king is gaga over this woman. He is, uh, and I don't think this was a deep committed love here. This is a king who goes gaga over pretty things. He decides this is the next Vashti. This is going to be his queen and he makes Esther into Queen Esther. Sometime later, Mordecai is at the city gate, which is the, essentially the commercial and business district of those days, and he overhears two of the officers of the king's bodyguard plotting to assassinate the king. He lets Esther know, who lets Xerxes know, and the assassination attempt is foiled, and you're wondering who's going to get played next with these deck of cards. But you have to understand the players to understand the story. And so uh, the story goes on. The king immediately forgets that uh, Mordecai was the guy. And time goes on. And a new character, the final character, the villain, is introduced into the plot of the story of Esther. And this man's name is Haman. We're going to call him a jack. He is a jack of evil. Uh, and Haman is elevated to the position of high honor and power, second only to the king. But Haman is just as twisted and crazed as Xerxes himself. His elevation to power means that everyone has to kneel before him and do obeisance and show him honor. And not just the common people, but the royal officials themselves. And Haman loved every minute of it. So he wallows in everyone's fear and in their obeisance and in their servitude and in their worship. And as the story unfolds, we learn that Haman not only loved power, he hated Jewish people. Uh, Haman was from a tribe called the Amalekites, who had been at war with Israel for centuries. Mordecai knows this, and he refuses to kneel down before Haman. And so what happens is Haman finds out who Mordecai is, decides to kill him, and when he learns that he's a Jew, decides he'll use this as a trigger event to execute all the Jews in the kingdom of Persia. So Haman manipulates Xerxes into ordering the killing of all the Jews and in putting Haman in charge of the job. In a very short time, the entire Persian population is weaponized. And they know that they are supposed to, on this specific day that has been chosen by the king, they are supposed to kill every Jew in the country. And there is weeping and anguish and fear among the Jewish people, as you can imagine. And they must have wondered, and now we're coming back to you in this story. They must have wondered, God, where are you? Have you abandoned us? What's going to happen? I mentioned at the outset that the book of Esther is the only book where God is never mentioned. It's not an oversight. It's not a mistake. It's deliberate on the part of the author. It's a literary device. The author is going to make a point, and this is the point that I want you to take home today. And the point is this. It's going to take me a minute or two to get to the point, so let me wind up to it. In the past, when God would rescue the Israelites, he always showed up in a big God way. Ten plagues for Egypt. Part the Red Sea. Manna feeding a million people for 40 years. Miraculous military victories. 
when God shows up, it's always obvious. But not here. Not in this book. No, no word from God. No wisdom for Esther or Mordecai. No fire, no power. God seems absolutely absent. But what's going to happen is this. When we get to the end of this book, in the end of this sermon series, we're going to see that a whole string of coincidences happened. And if they hadn't happened, all the Jews would have been wiped out. But these coincidences occurred and the Jews were saved. So here's the point. Here's the point. God is always at work. He is always at work, even in the most mundane and commonplace circumstances. He's always at work in your life. Just because you can't see him, just because he doesn't show up in a big God way, doesn't mean that God isn't working in your life. Stop and think of some of the little circumstances that we've already talked about it, that if they hadn't happened, the Jews would have been lost. If Xerxes hadn't gotten drunk and decided to show off Vashti, Vashti would still be the queen. But Esther had to be the queen in this story for the Jews to be saved. But what if Esther hadn't been a pretty? What if she'd have been just a plain Jane? Or what if Mordecai hadn't happened to overhear those two guys plotting? You're going to see all this plays into the story. All these little details, all these little things. Was God working his work? Ordinary things, little things that don't seem significant, but in the midst of it, God is at work, but you don't see it. You see, when God feeds an entire nation manna in the desert, you look out and you say, well, there's God. But when Xerxes gets drunk and starts bragging, you don't say, wow, God showed up. You just don't. The book of Esther is telling you that God is at work. He's always at work, working as well. And that's the most important thing for you to know for your life. It's why the book of Esther was written. When God acts in an extraordinary way, we know. But when God acts in an ordinary way, here's what you and I do. We immediately think he's not there. Rather than say, oh, he's moving in ways that I don't understand. Instead, what our sinful hearts do is immediately try to lead us to despair and say, God has abandoned me. He doesn't love me. He's punishing me. Uh, I don't know if I can trust him. God's hiddenness is never abandonment. He is working to bless you with good throughout your life. He is working on his promises. He is keeping his promises even when it looks like he's nowhere around. The key point of Esther is that God is always at work despite how it appears to you and me. The Bible is teaching us in the book of Esther, don't assume because you don't see it that God is not working. And here's the thing that I would add. How would you even know that God is working? You can't read God's mind any more than you can understand what he's doing in the day-to-day -day affairs of the world. There are things going on right now in your life, your life, completely ordinary things. Yet God is working through them. He's bending them to his will. He's arranging them to bless you, and you have no idea that he's even there. God is always at work despite appearances. Esther's story is a story of God appearing just the way God appears in your life and mine. Chances are your life is not a series of God miracles, the Red Sea parting, manna falling from heaven, every victory is a major victory. Most likely, your life is a series of details and insignificant occurrences, and only later, if even then, do you really see the thread of God's will? The Esther story is the first clue of God working in things that you wouldn't think would work. But it's not the best clue. The best clue of God working in your life and things that shouldn't work for you comes from God himself. In John 5, 17, Jesus said, My Father is always at his work, to this very day, and I too am working. He's teaching us the hiddenness of God's life. 
through his death on the cross, the most the thing where you would have said, there's no God, he's completely abandoned, there's all lost, there's nothing left. Who could ever imagine in the sadness of a violent death that God could bring about the greatest hope and the most profound peace that the world has ever known? But that's what God does. He works just when you wouldn't think it was going to work. If the fruitfulness of Jesus' death teaches us anything, it's that God is always at work and he'll bring fulfillment at his will. And here's what you can know. You can't know what God is doing with the details. I mean, it's God, after all. It's a little above our pay grade. You can't know what he's doing with the details, but here's what you can know. Without a doubt, complete assurance, you know that God loves you. He has bled for you. He has died for you. He's risen for you. And so you can trust him. Trust him. Trust him that he's got this. That he'll use the incidents and coincidences and uh, aspects of your life that you can't even see and may never know this side of heaven. Your life may be filled with Xerxes and Vashtis and Mordecais and Esthers and Hamans. They're all present. But I got to tell you, none of them are in charge. The Lord of the universe is working as well. And he will not be thwarted in his plan to give you the resurrection to eternal life. You can't see it in the moment. You may not see it this side of heaven, but that's okay. God's movement and his strategies and his plans and the silent working of his mysterious will are still going on. So trust him. No matter how dark the days, no matter how great the forces, trust him. He died so that you could live confident of his enduring love. So there were two young children. They were strapped into the car seats in the car, in the driveway. Mom and dad are bringing the luggage out of the house. And the neighbor walks up and he says, where are you going? The kids say, oh, we don't know. Well, when are you coming back? They're blank. We don't know. What are you going to do? Well, we don't know. Who are you going with? And their faces light up and they say, mom and dad. We're going with mom and dad. The only thing they knew about the journey was who was going with them on the journey. That's all you know. That's all you know. That's all you know. And that is enough. Settle in for the ride. There'll be some bumps and jostling along the way, and you won't know some days whether you're winning or losing, but you know what God will do in this journey. Paul talks about it. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose in all things. And you pray it every time you pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus has told you this. My Father is working to this very day, and I am working too. Trust Him. Trust Him. And your life will be so much beautiful, so much better, so delightful, because you put your trust in the only place that has earned it the life and death of Jesus Christ. And God is Father, your Savior, and your Lord. In Jesus we pray. Amen. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever. So sweet, it floods my soul.
So let's sum up our time together today. Uh, We've heard the word of God and the story of Esther. Uh, We've spent time considering that we are never alone, that God's silence should never be understood as his absence. And we've learned amongst other things that when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying the reality of God in our lives day by day, that his will is being done day by day. By day. And so let us pray together this prayer in closing today. The Lord's Prayer, I invite you to say it with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen.